uh, turn to Revelation, if you would. Uh, I done lost my spot here. Revelation chapter 3. Um, that's what we learned last week, is that Jesus is the one who openeth and no man shutteth. The one who shutteth and no man openeth. If Jesus locks it, then nobody can unlock it. If he seals it, then nobody can unseal it except him. Which is why in Revelation 5, when God has the book in his right hand, sealed with seven seals, the only person worthy to open the seals and to loose what was in the book was, of course, Jesus Christ. And you apply that now to your reading of the Bible. When you're reading the Bible, only Christ can unseal for you those things that are in it. And if he chooses to do that because he knows you want the truth, he knows you desire truth in your inward parts, he knows you desire uh, righteousness, he knows that you believe the words that are in this book, I believe Christ will unseal the book for you. He'll show you things in it that you've never saw before. Things that some theologians never in their lifetime see. And just my three years in, in Bible college taught me a lot about theologians. And in many cases, there are things in the Bible they just can't get a handle on. They just can't do it. Meanwhile, you just take people who sit in the pews every Sunday and read their Bible and believe it, and God shows them absolutely wonderful, great and mighty things that they never knew before. And it was a revelation from God, right from the Word of God. And they get it. And then the scholars, they don't understand it. Why? Because for them, for some reason, because, probably because of their unbelief, Christ has kept it sealed. But for those who believe, those who trust His Word, those who desire to His Word... And, and, and are always wanting, to, always wanting more from the Word. You're never satisfied with what you know. It's what I don't know. That's what I want to keep learning. And every now and then, God will just unseal something else for me. Show me something else. And I'll just go, oh, that is awesome. Uh, something happened this week, sort of along those lines. And... It's something I had read a few times before and didn't really understand it. And once I, I don't know, just something hit me out of the blue coming into work one day. And I went, that's what that means. Oh, that's neat. I couldn't hardly wait to get here. So anyway, uh, then in, in Revelation 3, verse, let's start it in verse 8. He said, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. Uh, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Keep, make, keep, keep that in your heart. Do not ever deny the name of Jesus. Who remembers when Rick Warren prayed at Obama's inauguration in 2008? Who remembers that? What name did he pray in? Isa. Who's Isa? Anybody know? It's the Muslim Jesus. The Muslim Jesus. See, Rick Warren heads up a group called Chrislam. And it's Christianity and Islam united together as if we can get along. Okay? Baptists in the same church can't even get along. But it's as if those two groups can get along. And so Warren does not want to offend any of his Muslim brotherhood friends. So he prays in the name of the Muslim Jesus. And the Muslim Jesus is not the Son of God. 
Allah has no son, according to Islam. And so he has rejected, in my opinion, the name of Jesus. He's rejected it. Uh, but he's got a lot of money. He's got a big following, so that must count for something. Uh, and so now he says, um, verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. And we had talked about this before. <clears throat> and I'm going to run through some, uh, another part of this uh, today called replacement theology. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved Thee. Now, I have run into all kinds of very strange, weird doctrines in my studies, in my research, in my years. One group called, they're called the British Israelites or um, Anglo Israel. They believe that if you are of white Anglo descent, then you are a member of the what they call the lost ten tribes of Israel. And that only, only those ten tribes can receive salvation. Only they can. No other race, according to them, can be saved. And they're pretty bold about it on their websites and their doctrinal statement. They, in other words, if you're white and delightsome, you're going to heaven. If you're brown, red, yellow, of any other descent, you cannot be saved. You cannot go to heaven. You're, you're the cursed child of Satan and you're going to hell. Joseph Smith, originally, him and Brigham Young, developed this idea that in the war in heaven, where a third of the angels fought against Michael and his angels, that there was a group of angels that remained neutral in that fight. And for that reason, God dispatched those neutral angels to the earth made their skin black, curled their hair, and made them live in Africa, and they are rejected by God and cannot be members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, they have since changed that, but that's what they originally believed. Um, what else? And, and, I'll, and if, if you go to northwest Arkansas, eastern Oklahoma... You're going to find yourself in the thick of people who believe that doctrine. There are compounds, camps, training facilities, you name it. In those hills, northwest Arkansas and the Ozarks, all over the place, training these pretend Jews... They're, and they say that the people who say they're Jews now are not Jews. Now that doesn't make sense to me. Why would a group of people who for literally for the last 2,000 years who have been kicked out of practically every country they've ever been in or been restricted in where they could live even before Nazi Germany Back in the 1500s, 1400s, 1300s, there were Jewish neighborhoods and the Jews were pretty much confined to living in those neighborhoods. They couldn't move outside of that. But they maintained their identity. And in many cases, they maintained their tribal identity in the form of their last name. Let me give you an example. This uh, 
hardware store over here called Lowe's. Lowe is a Germanic form of the Latin word Leo. What is Leo? Lion. What tribe is associated with the lion? Judah. So they were able to maintain their tribal identity through their last name. To this day, you have people named Cohen, Cohn, C-O-H-N, K-O-H-N. They are the Kohanim who were of the tribe of Levi. And you have other, other groups. I don't know all the, I don't know all the names, but somehow, some way, they were able to maintain not just the fact that they were Israelites, but they were able to maintain what tribe they were from by their last name. And they've been doing this for 2,000 years. They have never forgotten who they were, even though they've been persecuted, hated, murdered. And then you have, you have along with replacement theologians, you have Holocaust deniers, which is absolutely ridiculous. The Germans... One of the things that the Nuremberg trials found out was the Germans documented everything. I mean, they wrote documentation and facts and figures and memos on everything they did. And some of them were caught trying to burn these papers as the Allies were moving in. But fortunately, they didn't burn all of them. And as the Nuremberg trial lawyers were going through this stuff, they were just, they were flooded with German documents that detailed exactly how many Jews were killed in a certain day. Even running experiments on how many more they could kill in a certain day at a certain time. They ran experiments on how to kill the most Jews in one single day and had it all written out on paper. And you've got people who just, because of their theology and their ideology, they deny that. They say that's all made up and on and on and on. We're the, those weren't real Jews to begin with. Don't, don't fall for that stuff. That white supremacist stuff, I got, I've got no use for whatsoever. Um, but anyway, even in theology, there are groups that believe that we, as the church, have now replaced Israel as far as being the recipients of the promises of God. That now that God has rejected Israel, He has rejected them forever as a people, and He's no longer going to turn back and offer them salvation again in the last days in a lot of reformed churches. There used to be a man that, that used to go to this church a couple years ago that fell into Calvinist doctrine, Calvinist theology, and replacement theology. And he told me, he said, Pastor, I'm going to come by and talk to you one day because I've got, I've got a revelation about, about who the real Israel is. And I just went, oh, no. And sure enough, he came by and told me that we're the real Israel, God's done with them, and we're the real Jews, and we kind of got into a, kind of got into an argument over it. And I told him, I said, I love you. I said, but I'm not going to let you spread that through this church. I'm not going to let you do that. If you want to believe that, that's fine. But keep it to yourself because I do not want you bringing confusion into this church by trying to draw other people to your ideology. Um, needless to say, the Jews are still the Jews. They've always been the Jews. They've always maintained their identity. Um, some of you might be able to say, well, I, I'm of Germanic um, 
ancestry or I'm, I'm of British ancestry or I've got a little Indian in me or whatever. But not too many of us can trace our lineage all the way back 4,000 years to Abraham. Or to a forefather, something, something like that. Not too many of us can do that. So you have people already at this time who are claiming they are Jews, but they are not. They do lie, Jesus said. And I'll make them come and worship before thee at thy feet. So what does the Bible say about that? Turn to Romans 11. Um, a man that I highly regarded in my youth, and I, I still love him, I believe him to be a man of God. But I was sitting talking to him one time and he said, I used to believe in uh, certain things, but he said, I've just become a believer that... Um, God is done with Israel as a nation. That some of them might get saved, but as a nation, God's done with them. And that, I'm just going, did I just hear you say that? That bothered me. Romans 11, verse 1. Paul said, I say then, hath God cast away his people? And he answers his own question, God forbid. How can God cast away his people? He says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And by the way, out of all the peoples in the world, all of the, the Genesis chapter 10 delineates 72 different family lines that have populated the earth. Out of 72 of those, which family line did Jesus spring from? Was it the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites? The Elamites, where did he come from? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. He's a Jew. Jesus chose out of all of those families, all of those tribes, all of those peoples, Jesus came as a Jew. Uh, verse 2, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I uh, am left alone, and they seek my life. In other words, Elijah was saying, God, none of them serves you anymore except me. So how can you, how can you love these people when they hate you so bad? There's only me left. And they seek to kill me. If they kill me, there won't be none of us left that still loves you. But, verse 4, but what saith the answer of God unto him? God said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And they were Jews, 7,000 Jews that God said have not bowed to the image of Baal. In fact, I, I believe he said uh, back in, um, what was that, 1 Kings, that they have not kissed Baal. They've not fallen and worshipped him. They've not adored Baal. They won't have anything to do with him. And I reserved for myself 7,000 of them. And I believe that's a foreshadowing of the last days. Uh, verse 5. So Paul said, even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And it's elect, they're elected by the word that he used, um, let's see here. Verse 2, 
God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. So there again is God's election according to his foreknowledge. He knows who is going to be right and who isn't going to be right with God, but he does not choose that for them. He knows what they will choose and he elects those who choose right and righteousness. That's, that's his election according to foreknowledge. That is his predestination according to his foreknowledge. He knows who's going to choose right, so he determines before the foundation of the world that their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He wrote it there himself before the earth ever was, knowing the outcome of their life, knowing what they would choose throughout their life. God knew it, or he wouldn't be much of a God. So he says, verse 5 again, even so at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. And I do not, somebody accuse me of this, I do not agree with John Hagee and his false doctrine that God is going to restore Israel by way of animal sacrifices. Not, not, not going to do that. Because that then is their being saved by works rather than grace. After God has sacrificed his only begotten son, what good does it do to sacrifice an animal after that? Nothing. No good whatsoever. In fact, you're almost mocking and making a mockery of the cross when you sacrifice a, a sheep or a goat or a calf or whatever it is on an altar saying that's an atonement for sins when Christ has already atoned for sins. <sighs> mm. I don't know where Hagee gets his nonsense, but you don't get it from the Bible. I know that. So in verse 6, and if by grace then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And then you have these, some of these dispensationalists, hyper-dispensationalists, who say that there was a gospel in Noah's day, there was a gospel in Adam's day, there was a gospel in Moses' day, there was a different gospel in these different, in these different eras of time, a different way of being saved. And they say then that there is a, that we have the gospel of grace in the church age, but during the time of tribulation, the Jews are going to be saved with grace plus works. But what did Paul just say? If it's works, it can't be grace. And if it's grace, it can't be works. You cannot put the two of them together to save somebody. Can't do it. Um, verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written... God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. Now, God has allowed Israel's eyes to be blinded, their ears to become deaf, so that God then could focus and offer his salvation to all of the Gentiles, all of the peoples of the earth. Um, and, and we, we've seen that when we've read, uh, Revelation seven, the two distinct groups that are, that are dealt with by God in Revelation seven. You have the 12,000 from each tribe that are given the seal of God in their foreheads, which is the Holy Spirit. And then immediately after that, you have, uh, an, a multitude, which no man could number out of all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues from all over the earth, all different 
types of people, all different colors of people, all different languages of people. Everybody, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Every one of them, God has, has taken them out of the world of the Gentiles and offered them salvation. Again, two clear and distinct groups. Yet God saves them both, I believe, by grace. So, verse um, 9 and David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, Salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. And I, rem I remember learning about this jealousy all the way back when I was probably... Jaden, how old are you? Eight? Well, I was a little bit older then. I'm going to say probably 11 years old. I remember learning about this jealousy in the story of Jacob and Esau. Did God use Jacob to provoke Esau to jealousy? Yes. Because even though Esau was the firstborn and should have received the inheritance, because of his foolish, brute, beast mind, he chose a bowl of pottage over his inheritance, sold that to Jacob. What good's an inheritance going to do me if I die of hunger? He was exaggerating, of course. He'd only gone, what, a few hours without eating? But then, when it came time for the father to give him the blessing, Jacob goes in wearing goat. Well, that must have been one hairy guy. If he goes in wearing goat fur and his father goes, yep, that's my son. Smells like him too. <sighs> the voices of Jacob, but that's Esau's smell. <laughs> and he gives him the blessing. Okay. And it provoked Esau to jealousy. And so here's the plan of God. The Jews to this day pride themselves on their prayers that they read, on the phylacteries that they still wear on their foreheads, those little boxes on their forehead with a little piece of scripture written in it. They still pride themselves on what they believe is keeping the law. The truth of it is they're not. But that's their pride. And here is a group of people all over the world, Gentiles, and the Jews hate Gentiles. They don't mind making money off of them. But other than that, they don't like us. And what God's going to do is he's going to show forth that he's going to glorify the Gentiles who have not kept the works of the law to provoke Israel to jealousy. To cause Israel then to do what Esau did. He cried to his father, Jacob, or excuse me, Joseph, uh, Isaac. He cries to his father, Isaac, and he begs him, is there nothing left for me? And if you read, if you read the blessing that Isaac gives to Esau, it's nearly identical to what he gives to Jacob. But he says, Jacob's dominion must be taken off of you before you can get this. And what that means is the Gentiles have to be taken away and out of the way before you can receive your blessing. And then you'll get it. Okay. Um, so he says, verse 11, I say then, if they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now look at verse 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, 
and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. How much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh. In other words, my own people, my own Jewish brethren. And might save some of them. For if the casting away of them, the Jews, be the reconciling of the world or the rest of the world, the Gentiles, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And in that we go back and reference the dry bones. Clearly, you're, you can't get any more dead than nothing but dry, brittle, Bones scattered out all over a wilderness, all over a desert. And yet he prophesies once and the bones come together and sinew grows on them, muscle, organs, skin. But there's no breath. So prophesy again. He prophesies again. And all of a sudden the four winds, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Come and blow, breathe the breath into these bones. And now they come alive, a great army for the Lord. This is the revival of the Jewish people. They're coming back from the dead. They're dead in trespasses and sins. And God is bringing them back again. So he says in verse 16, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So think about this tree now. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Now the root and the tree is Christ. The original branches were the Israelites. But because of their pride, because of their unbelief, God broke those branches off and cast them away. And then he went and found us Gentiles, wild olive trees, wild, crazy people. Something wrong with us. Rednecks, hillbillies. People don't know how to tie shoes if they had them. And he takes us and grafts us in. Anybody ever grafted something? Grafted? Yeah. You notch it, put it on there, tie it up. And after a while, if it takes, that, that, that wild branch from that other tree will grow into this tree and become part of that tree. God designed it that way. So they're grafted into this tree now so that we, as the Gentile believers, are receiving of the fatness, the DNA, the watering, the nutrients coming up from the roots, we're now part of the tree of life, the tree of Jesus Christ, by faith. Now, <clears throat> he tells us, verse 18, boast not against the branches. In other words, don't think, well, we're much better than Israel. God selected us over them. Don't replace them and think that you now are the only Israel that can be. And he's going to say it here in a minute. If God is able to take wild olive branches and graft them in the tree, why wouldn't he be able to take natural branches and put them back on the tree? Of course, that'll work. That's their tree. So he says... Um, Let's see here. Verse, uh, some of the, okay. Verse 18. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. 
Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. I already read that. Uh, verse 22, Behold, therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. I, and here again, I believe in a continuance of faith for salvation. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more should these, which be the natural branches, be graft into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Here it is. That blindness in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In other words, there's coming a time God's going to save the last Gentile. The last Gentile to be saved is going to be saved. I believe at that point, God is going to resurrect those saints in the translation, in the rapture, and then God then is going to take the natural branches of Israel, a remnant, and graft them in to their, to their own tree, and they are going to be saved forever. Somebody say amen. That's what I believe. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. God's going to take away all their transgressions just like he did you. And how's he going to do it? Through faith, by grace, through faith. Not sacrificing animals again, not by works of the law again, but by grace. Somebody say amen. Don't replace Israel. Don't curse Israel by replacing them. Amen. Father, we ask your blessings on your word today. Bless it in the hearts of these people. And Father, those, Lord, who have questions about this, Lord, I pray your God that your word would go into their heart. Father, they would study it out, seek it out, not get their doctrine from the internet, but get their doctrine from the word of God. They would find out that this Bible's right, you're going to save Israel or a remnant of Israel once again. You already have that remnant in mind. You have even the names and the numbers from each tribe, Father, all figured out. How many you're going to save and what you're going to do with them. Father, help us, dear God, to never lay a curse upon Israel by stealing away from them or taking away from them their rightful place and their rightful blessings in the kingdom of God. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.